Um, there we go. Um, so there was a lot of conversation in the recent legacy members last week about capacity. So in today's seminar, Oliver's going to talk about um, update to charity law and compliance, which is relevant to gifts in wills, and do a deeper dive into capacity issues and why they matter to your charity. Um, so if you've got any questions, we really want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, so throw your questions out, you know, raise your hand um, on Zoom or just unmute yourself or just put it in chat if you want to. Um, but it'd be great if we can get some interaction. So I'll hand over to Oliver. Super. Thank you very much indeed, Marie. Um, and hello, everybody. And um, hello again to everybody who was here on, um, well, at, in, um, in London last Thursday. I think there was a lot of chat about capacity um, and about what's going on with that and gifts and wills in the online space, but also more widely. Um, it's something that everybody has to think about. Just, um, just so I can know exactly who we've got in the room, um, can I ask everybody to e raise their hand either physically or using the little um, reaction icon um, like that on the um, uh, on the reactions tab at the bottom um, so I can see who we're speaking to and who you want to what you would like me to um, do a deeper dive into so everybody or everybody who's um, not currently making a cup of tea um, oh, oh, hello, Liz. Thank you. Uh, super. You can see who knows how to use the reactions tab and who just puts their video on now. So, um, great. So, um, oh, I've got a clap from Chloe as well. Thank you. Um, so, thank you. So, who here is a, um, a Gifts and Wills fundraiser? Um, who has the responsibility for leaving, uh, for collecting or pledges for Gifts and Wills? So that has got us at about, um, I mean, I was flying all over the place here, um, around about two thirds of people. Great. Leave your hand up if you have any other um, responsibilities, including um, communicating with the, um, with the CEO board um, on fundraising and strategic matters. So leave your hand up. OK, so that means we've got about two thirds of people who um, deal with gifts and wills and we've got three people who have a bit of a wider, um, a wider um, ambit. That's really useful to know. Um, so I'm going to kick off. I'm going to talk about um, updates to charity law and compliance first, because, you know, everybody loves compliance. Um, but I'm going to try and look at it because there's going to be quite some quite um, interesting things coming up um, over the next year or two um, with the fundraising regulator, with the Charities Act 2022 and with uh, reporting um, to the Charity Commission, which could be useful in the wider um, aspect, but also specifically if you're communicating with the board, with the CEO about gifts and wills. So, um, there's a bit of a discussion on PowerPoint and slides um, at the Charities um, this um, Special Interest Group meeting last uh, last week on Thursday. I'm afraid I've got boring lawyer slides, so um, uh, they're not going to be quite as um, exciting or engaging as the ones that we have from um, uh, Katrina. Um, just a quick introduction. My name's Oliver. I'm the um, head of legal at the Digital Legal um, Group of Companies. I'm a trust and estate practitioner. Um, I'm a solicitor and I'm a member of the um, Society of Trust and Estate Practitioners Mental Capacity Special Interest Group. It's, it's a real passion of mine, along with making wills. Um, I'm the head of legal and director at um, the DigiLegal group of companies, um, which includes Make a Will Online, um, stands behind us, Capacity Vault, and also the DigiLegal um, Trustees Company. Uh, we founded in 2008 in order to make sure that everybody can access legal services 
um, and nobody has to die without a will uh, and leave the problems behind. We've grown into the area of capacity because that's one of the biggest growing areas of potential concern for families. I want to talk to you about that. I've also been a, um, on the board of um, charities. I've advised charities in private practice um, and uh, you know nobody likes compliance but it, it's a thing um, and if you have the right messages you can really use it to grow the gifts in wills message for your charities so here we go compliance um i'm going to talk to you about the coming consultation about um what should go into charity annual returns it's consultation by the charity commission um and they have raised about five new things that they want to talk about on an ongoing basis um, in, in returns. First of those is um, the diversity of income. I'm going to come back to that. There's some other uh, points about payments for goods and services for trustees, um, premises, organisation, etc. Um, diversity of income, that's what I want to talk to you about, because it's important um, for gifts in wills fundraisers. Um, Going forward, you may well find a situation where you, the, the, the board, the CEO is expected to um, go into more depth about the diversity and also potential resilience um, of income streams. And as everybody here knows, um, gifts in wills are growing and they're also a resilient form of fundraising. They are over time um, going to grow and they are more shock proof to, you know, 2008 recession, the, um, uh, the, the shock in 2016 pandemic um, and the current shock. They're more um, resilient than a lot of the other monthly or, um, or community or, or challenge fundraising streams. Going to chat to you about the... Um, the Charities Act 2022, which is uh, going to be coming in in dribs and drabs over the um, next uh, couple of years. Um, within all of this, by the way, we're going to share the links after the um, after the meeting in the show notes, so you can go and take a look at the sources of these. Um, again, talking about statutory power to pay trustees, um, not so um, important necessarily here. Um, there's going to be a greater power to make moral or ex gratia payments um, for charity funds. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Um, and there's something about uh, failed fundraising appeals. Now, I know that a lot of concerns around reputational risk for gifts in wills come from what happens if there's a challenge? What if there's a um, 1975 Act challenge? What if family members aren't happy? What if there's a, um, a restricted funds with other requirements. This is going to be tested. This moral ex gratia payments um, is something which is going to be tested probably at courts, um, but definitely by the um, Charity Commission. Treat with caution. Look at the updates. Follow what's going on with this. Um, but it, I have a feeling it's going to make fundraising for gifts and wills um, and management um, of the legacies are much less constrained um, thing. So um, it's there, be aware of it, take advice before you do anything with it, um, uh, but know that it's a tool in the toolbox, which has been strengthened by the Charities Act 2002. Finally, um, in the compliance um, and legal update section, um, there's going to be a review of the um, of the fundraising regulator code of practice and um, they've got a strategic plan. Uh, I've been through it, couldn't see any mention of legacies and gifts in wills, which is good news. Um, they've already updated it a couple of times over the last few years. Um, and I'm sure none of you want any more uh, rules and regs. Um, the review of the code is going to happen this year and next year. So possibly by this time next year, we might have a new code. The current rule around gifts and wills is rule 15 of the fundraising code. Um, it hasn't been updated. And anybody who has a campaign with Make a Will Online will have 
um, charity commission uh, or fundraising regulator compliant wording included um, as part of the package. Make sure whatever you do, it's um, it's there, it's compliant. Um, so that's the um, that's a review of the law. Um, I think that's going to be very relevant to the three of you who kept your hands up. Hopefully it's going to be useful to the two thirds of you who um, who put your hands up to say that you um, fundraise for gifts in wills. There are going to be things which are going to um, make your life easier. I'm going to go into testamentary capacity now. Um, just a quick question. Again, little hands up. Um, if you were here at the last training that we ran in spring um, around testamentary capacity, put your hands up um, physically or with the um, with the reactions tab, um, just so I know uh, how much to, to wax on. I'm not seeing any hands at present. Is that is that right? Oh no, I've got I've got no I have I've got Victoria. Um, you were hit. Thank you, Victoria. Um, appreciated. Um, but this is going to be, there's going to be some revision um, for you, Victoria, apologies in advance, um, but the rest, um, hopefully this should be fresh information. A lot of the conversation last Thursday at the um, SIG meeting um, was about testamentary capacity. Um, so what I want to do today is, is go through um, what is going on and why it's relevant. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on what is testamentary capacity. I'm going to talk to you about why it matters um, and why it should matter to everybody who's in the room today. Um, I'm going to say who should be doing something about testamentary capacity and um, where supporters can go to get that um, extra help and where you can go if you've got any questions um, about a potentially contentious matter. I didn't know who, by the way, dealt with um, legacy management as well as fundraising. I had a note to ask you, um, but if you've got any questions about legacy management, do um, pipe up and let me know. Uh, and finally, I'm going to talk about when, um, when you or a supporter should be taking action, uh, when you should be giving advice or suggestions or guidance or signposting to your supporters. So what is it? What is testamentary capacity? Um, it's something that everybody needs in order to make a will. You need effectively two things. You need to be an adult uh, to make a will um, and you need to be able to show that you, well, and you need testamentary capacity. The test for testamentary capacity to show that you knew what you were doing when you made the will, it was set out ages ago, um, but those rules have remained really good law and they're tested on a yearly basis at the higher courts in the UK. Um, you need to show that you've got sound mind. You need to show that you know what's going on when you are signing your will. You need to show that you've got sound memory. What that means is you need to be able to um, demonstrate that you know what your estate looks like you need to know what you own um in high level terms you know i've got a house i've got a commercial property somewhere and i've got some shares or you know i've got a bank account whatever it is you need to know what you've got and the third limb is sound understanding now that means you know what your situation is around the family um around the people who would expect to inherit um, you know um, about spouses, children, grandchildren. Um, and there's a fourth test, which I thought had been, you know, been and gone and been dealt with, um, that someone has no insane delusion or disorder of the mind that could poison their affection towards others. Um, very, very 19th century language, but it was tested just a couple of years ago um, in a case in Key v Key when someone was suffering from uh, profound grief um, and it is still an important part of the test. So it's something we need to deal with. Worth mentioning for anybody who is aware of the goings on and, and capacity um, in other forms, 
we're not using the Mental Capacity Act uh, 2005 or the updated um, uh, changes to that which came in last year. Um, it, this 18th, 19th century test remains good law. So that's what it is. Um, you know what's up, you know um, who should inherit, you know what you've got. Um, why does it matter? Um, so a couple of things. Um, peace of mind for your supporters. Um, if a will that someone makes could be challenged and, and booted out, that doesn't give people that that knowledge that their wishes have been properly um, properly set out. What can they do to protect it? It matters. It matters to our partner charities as well, because there is a reduced risk of challenge when it's been dealt with. Um, and challenge is just going to increase. I've got a little screen grab here um, from the BBC uh, from a little while back. Um, there's likely to be more challenges. Something here in the pink paper from just a few weeks ago. Um, challenges uh, to uh, probate have gone up by um, 37 percent. Um, that's research in the um, in the FT. The best information at present is from 2015 around um, around challenges to wills for REM charities. Um, that was carried out I think, by Legacy Foresight. Uh, it was a longitudinal study which finished in 2015. Around about five percent of wills with gifts in wills are challenged. And a good proportion of them um, are to do with capacity or undue influence. Um, and the higher the value of the um, uh, of the gift in a will, the more likely the chance of challenge. Um, and there are financial implications for you for those challenges. Um, it's expensive. It takes time. Uh, you could lose that income that you thought was coming your way under a will. And there's a the reputational thing, um, you know, um, the cases like um, that, that come up in the uh, papers every couple of years. Um, don't do the industry of gifts and wills um, very many favours. And there are aspects of the um, tabloid play, press that love one of those stories. So who needs to consider testamentary capacity? Now look at it from a supporter's point of view. Um, this is laid out in case law as well. I'm going to come out and say, I don't like this law. I think it's bad, but it hasn't been reviewed. It's not going to be looked at in the um, consultation on Mental Capacity Act. Um, and there's this horrible case which keeps on rearing its head. Um, sometimes it is followed, sometimes it is not. Um, hang on, I've just got a, um, a question in the chat. And so before I go into um, uh, Ree Simpson, I'm going to read this question out and go back to the relevant part. Um, question from Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Is can you say a bit more about how the test for sound mind is applied in practice? Um, and the contest. Um, where the. Um, test data was not of sound mind. Right, so Rachel, um, really good question. Um, sound mind is addressed and it's, um, it says, it goes into whether someone knew what they were doing when they signed their will. And there is a caveat to that, which is a place that I would not want any of my partner charities to be in. And I wouldn't want to be a solicitor trying to talk about it. But if someone knows what they're doing when they sign their will, they have signed sound mind. If they know what the, um, the implications of signing a will, they know it's a legal document, they know that it's going to be um, setting out what they want to, in their estate once they've died. Um, and if, they, um, if they're doing it all of their own volition, um, and then they've got sound mind. There's another caveat to that, which I'm going to come to in a bit, uh, but I'm not going to go into now. Um, if you have any, want to go into it any deeper, um, do let me know in the chat or, or pop up or ask a question at the end. Um, I'm going to fast forward to Re Simpson again. Basically, what this case says, um, and it was Lord Templeman, um, and I'm going to come back to him in just a minute. He said that anybody who is elderly or aged without any further guidance on what that means um, or anybody 
who has suffered a serious illness without any um, information on timescales um, should take extra steps by getting a testamentary capacity assessment or getting their will signed by a medical professional who puts a, um, a note in their medical record. All sorts of problems with that, um, which I'll come to in a minute, uh, but mainly all the Royal Colleges have now put out guidance to their doctors saying, do not witness wills, um, because if you do, and the will is challenged, you end up having to go to court, being cross-examined by a barrister, who's got one aim, which is to make you and your um, medical opinion uh, look stupid so that the opposing side can win their case. So, so that is the law from Rhys Simpson. What I would say, I would widen who needs to um, think about getting um, some protection around capacity. I'd widen it to anybody who is concerned that their will might be challenged. You know, if there's a complicated family um, structure with potential for disputes, if there's anybody who thinks there might be anyone in the wings, if there's anybody who's doing something that might be unexpected, um, take steps to protect your will uh, from challenge under testamentary capacity. And also, you know, as part of those un unexpected things, I'd say anybody making substantial gifts to charity, um, you know, there's all sorts of wonderful work with philanthropy you know the setting up of the roddick foundation the, the um you know the the, the patagonia chapter. there's lots of people who want to give a lot of their wealth um to 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 causes they believe in so that their their values will continue when they're gone sometimes family members like to say that you know gramps or grand didn't know what they were doing when they did that um so if there's anything like that take action to protect that will against challenge from testamentary capacity. Just a side note, um, in 2020, there was a case, um, Goss Custard versus Templeman, um, whose name, yes, you do recognize, it is the one and the same. He made his will in 2008. He was aged, he had been seriously unwell. Um, he did not get a medical practi practitioner to witness his will and put a note on his medical record to say that he um, he had capacity when he made his will. And here we go, um, in the High Court, we've got a, um, a claim against his estate. It's very sad um, whenever there's any disputes in family like this, um, but it can happen to anybody. And it is something which is going to happen more over the years. So action does need to be taken. So where can you go? Um, so let's talk about this from a supporter's perspective again. Where can you go? Um, traditionally, I think what Tim Temple was talking about was go and speak with your GP. You've known them for years. They know you. They know what your uh, medical record is. Um, get them to um, witness your will. Unfortunately, it's very, very rare that a GP um, would agree to that or any other practitioner. You can go to a doctor um, it's very difficult to get outside the M25 um, for a private testamentary capacity assessment and they tend to cost about £1,500 plus that. Um, a lot of people aren't going to bother doing that um, cost benefit um, and it's a shame because the cost of a dispute is going to be way more than that. Um, you can get social worker testamentary capacity assessments. I don't know how much judges like um, capacity assessments from social workers. They're cheaper um, they cost from about £500 when you've got um, travel taken care of. Capacity Vault, you know, plug, um, Capacity Vault um, does it. If you are a member of the public, it costs £150. If you are making your will through Make-A-Will Online, it's free. Every single will that Make-A-Will Online does comes with free access to Capacity Vault. We want people to... Um, to be protected and we know from consulting with um, relevant experts that you have to suggest this to everybody you don't know when you are um, providing wills to somebody um, whether or not there's something in the background or whether or not they have medical diagnoses which would require them to so everybody who makes a will for us gets offered um, capacity vault for free uh, and we make sure that that is followed up in correspondence um going forwards so it can be done 
Okay, we're up to coming up to half past. I've got about another 10 minutes of chatting to go and then we've got some time for questions. Um, when should you take action? Um, or when should the sports take action immediately before or after executing the will? Executing the will is signing it in front of two witnesses or well, beneficiaries. Um, and when you do that, uh, just pick up your phone and make a capacity vault recording there and then. Um, exceptions are best avoided um, that I mentioned when I was dealing with Rebecca's question. There's something called the rule in, rule in Parker and Felgate. This is where you do not want to go if you are trying to defend a will. Uh, it's where somebody, um, Mr. Um, I don't know, uh, Mr. Parker, Mr. call it Mr. Parker. Um, oh no, call it Mr. Felgate. Mr. Felgate um, gave instructions to his solicitor um, and he had intermittent capacity or, or fading capacity, gave instructions to his solicitor whilst he had capacity. By the time it was drafted, by the time he came to sign it, he lacked capacity. But he remembered giving instructions to his solicitor and he remembered that it's what he wanted at the time. You are threading the eye of a needle there. I would not want anybody um, to, um, to have to rely on that for a substantial gift to their charity. Um, it is not a good place to go. So much better have a recording when the will is made um, showing the capacity of your supporter. Um, I've already mentioned Tell every supporter that is thinking of making a will, you don't know what their situation is medically or what their family situation is. Ba -ba 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 Very quick chat about will writing trends. Uh, more and more people are making their wills remotely, either online, over the telephone or with one of their professional advisors. Since the pandemic, 95% of the will writers that we, um, we surveyed at the beginning of the year had um, made a will remotely, just 32 had made them in 2020. Um, in 2020, nine out of 10 wills that were contested at courts included a claim for lack of testamentary capacity. You'd almost be negligent as a solicitor if you didn't pop that in, because as soon as you say um, that the person making the will didn't have capacity, you are more likely to be successful in your claim to get that will overturned. Bum, bum, bum. And um, yes, when we surveyed, 45% of the will writers we surveyed were worried about challenges to their wills around on the, on the um, terms of testamentary capacity. I think it should have been higher. Uh, I think everybody should be worried about it and everyone should take action. So what are we doing about it? I've mentioned capacity vault. I haven't told you what it is. Um, I'll spend the next few minutes explaining what this solution is, what it looks like, how it can be used. Um, you can go to capacityvault.co.uk, take a look at yourself. Um, but what it does is it takes a supporter through an interview just on their phone um, and it asks all the questions that a judge will need when they are take, going through those tests for sound minds sound memory and sound understanding. We get everything that they need um, in order to see for themselves. We record it, we store it, we encrypt it, and we store it in such a way that we can produce it as evidence to the court. So if there's ever a challenge uh, to a will, we can pop up and go, right, this is what they said on the date, it's encrypted, it's tamper proof, um, and here is a certified copy of the original recording which the courts will accept. That is going to kibosh um, all but the most bravest or stupidest of, of challenges. How does it do it? Um, through a 15 minute, 10 minute um, interview um, online, um, you um, pop in, watch a short tutorial, you um, make a recording, answering all the questions that you're asked about, you know, what is making a will, what does, um, uh, what do you own, um, who would expect to inherit, and are there any surprises in there? And who should use it? Well, I went into that already. Um, uh, it's anybody who is elderly, anybody who has been unwell, anybody who thinks that their will might be challenged, or anybody who's putting any surprises 
or large gifts into their will. Um, got a video here, but in the, oh yeah, pop, pop this off. Um, in the interest of brevity, I'm gonna skip that, but I'm gonna circulate it in the, um, uh, in the show notes afterwards. Um, Boom. So this is what it does. How do we do it? Um, Chris, your um, account, through, use the browser's um, camera and microphone. There's no need to download an app or do anything that older clients might find confusing or challenging. And we have secure encrypted storage using aspects of AI and blockchain technology so that we've got a video that we will always be able to, um, uh, to produce to the courts. Uh, and we do all of the legal statements that are required to submit that as evidence uh, to the courts. That's a Lark and Nugus letter um, is the technical term. What does it look like? I'm gonna show you a very quick, um, a very quick recording, which is uh, it's an actor playing it, but it's um, a, a legitimate video which has been recorded through the service. So you can see um, what the outputs are if a will is ever challenged. Please confirm your full name. Mary Smith. What is your date of birth? It's the 1st of the 3rd. Um, 1952. State today's date and the time now. The 10th of January and it's 6.05 p.m. Please briefly say how you discovered Capacity Vault. I, it was recommended to me by a friend. When you learned of this service, was there any specific reason for your decision to use it? It was very clear to understand from the um, website. What would you like to achieve by using this service? Um, I would like the people in my family and friends to understand precisely what my wishes are. Okay. So that's that's the outputs. That's what um, that's what the courts will see. It will go on what that interview goes on to ask about um, people understanding what the nature of making a will is. It goes on to um, talk about what the um, uh, what what's in someone's estate. Um, talks about their family. Everything the court needs in order to um, uh, in order to determine for themselves um, that your supporter has capacity. Um, I have a question in the chat. Are there any examples of capacity vault being tested in court? Good question. Um, so capacity vault launched in January. The typical time period for a case to get to court uh, can be two, three, four years. In that Templeman case, um, he died in 2014 and the case was heard in 2020. Um, so not yet, um, and it's something which we um, which we wanted to make sure would work in court. Uh, and so when we put the team together, um, you can read more about the team on the website. But um, a key player was Lee Sagar. He is a barrister, and he is a contentious wills expert, um, and he is also the um, uh, on the board of the Society of Trust and Estate Practitioners. Um, and he knows about technology and um, court evidence, probably better than anybody else in contentious probate. So we followed his advice all the way through to make sure that it would be. It's a very good question. It hasn't reached court yet. Um, and it's probably not likely to for a few years, not least because the existence of a capacity vault recording is gonna drastically reduce the chance of a um of a claim actually getting there especially on the head of capacity because everybody will see for themselves before it gets to court um what somebody's um capacity was so um very quickly um we've got a couple of minutes before questions who should use capacity vault um i'm going to say um these aged and unwell people 
um, anybody where there is any risk of a challenge, why not just do it? The other thing about Capacity Vault, as you can see from the video, um, it will provide strong evidence around anything else like undue influence or fraud. Um, when you're making that recording, it's a single take and it is very obvious if people keep on looking off screen for guidance or help or um, for any other reason. Uh, it's not its intended use, but it's, um, it's there to protect people making their wills. Who should make it, especially remote wills, remote wills, um, not DIY wills, um, they fall into their own category of um, potential problems, but people making wills over the telephone, people making their wills online, the services that we provide um, our clients, online wills and telephone wills, have capacity vault available. Um, so important if a solicitor isn't in the room with somebody. Wills made by will writers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you're making a will sitting in front of somebody, the will writer should want to protect themselves from that horrible cross-examination situation if a will is challenged. Capacity Vault will do that. More solicitors are, um, are signing up and getting interested in using Capacity Vault in their day-to-day -day, um, will writing practice. Um, so, and most of all, anybody with any substantial gift. We know that the higher the value of a gift to charity, the more likely that gift is going to be challenged. Um, so if there's a substantial gift, use Capacity Vault. Get rid of that head of challenge, which is so easy and going to be so difficult and expensive for you to, um, uh, to, for you to have to deal with when you should be receiving the gift that your supporter wanted to give you. So in conclusion, any will can be challenged, even if you are a Lord Justice. Um, challenges are always disruptive. Um, capacity assessment, capacity um, challenges are, are regular. Um, you'd almost be negligent to not say that the person making the will didn't have capacity when you are challenging a will. And, but those assessments are very difficult to come by and or expensive. So um, use Capacity Vault. There are concerns around all wills, wills made remotely online or over the telephone like we do, or face-to-face -face like your other providers um, do. Um, everybody can benefit from Capacity Vault. Um, so yeah, offer Capacity Vault to protect your supporters' wishes and save yourselves time in the future. There is one, um, one question in the chat. Okay, so I've got a question here. If anybody, we've got another five minutes um, or so um, where I, I can field questions. I've got a question in the chat. Um, and if anybody wants to pipe up and ask them anything about the um, uh, compliance and, and legal updates about the, um, about the uh, updates to the law or about the, um, uh, about capacity, let me kick off with um, kick off with uh, Marsha's question. Oliver, Oliver, do you want to show um, turn the presentation off so we can see that that's it? All oh, right, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're going to fill up me now. Um, so I've got a question for from Marsha, and I've got another um, anonymous question popped up in the chat. Um, so Marsha's question is: there could potentially be a long time between making a will and it being challenged e.g. if someone makes their will online at 60 but dies at 90. Are there any plans on keeping up with changing technology with the recordings so they can be accessed decades into the future? Yeah, so um, really good question. Um, two points to deal with here. One is the technology, um, you know, accessing MP4 files um, uh, and the structure of the, um, the, the files which are put together. Um, and also the technology that that information is stored on. Anyone remember floppy disks? Um, I believe it or not, um, came across floppy disks attached to legal documents um, probably 20 years after they're made. It was a nightmare. Um, there's another thing you gotta think about and which really came to the fore with that floppy disk, it's entropy. Entropy is um, a fact of the universe. It is the degradation of information over time. So 
there could be a long time between um, will it being challenged. We do not have any scheduled deletions of any information um, that we store, and we guarantee that we keep it um, for the lifetime. Um, we've looked into the tech, and we believe that we've got at least 50 years or so before that entropy issue comes to the fore. Now, um, the technology that it's stored on, we are storing the originals in uh, long-term storage. We're encrypting it um, in such a way um, that it cannot be tampered with. Um, so we've got the, the long-term um, integrity of the information. We've got the encryption. We've got the, um, the format. Format is going to be MP4, and that's been a standard for many years. And there will be reversibly compatible information in the future in order to access that in the same way that um, if you look hard enough online, you can find people to um, decode your floppy disks um, that many years later. Um, and then we've got the ent entropy point. That is something which we are taking very, very seriously. And we want to make sure that these videos and the integrity of them is going to are going to be useful for a very long time. The likelihood of somebody needing it any more than you know, five or 10 years after uh, making a will before their death is low, but it exists. And it's something that we are, we've, we've taken every step that we can. I'm not the tech bod, um, but I know that it's something which is um, being dealt with by our dev team. Any other questions that people want to mention? I've got another one um, in the chat. Um, can charities access Capacity Vault um, without make will online? The answer is yes, um, charities on, can go on a one by one basis. You can send supporters to um, Capacity Vault in order to, um, to make their, their wills, um, or in order to protect their wills with that recording. Um, it, because of the way uh, Make a Will Online um, funded Capacity Vault, it's always going to be cheaper for the charity and the supporter uh, and all the supporter to make their wills through Make a Will Online in order to get access to Capacity Vault. But if someone really doesn't want to do that, get in touch with me and Marie and we can talk to you about the, um, the charity programme, which will allow your supporters um, benefits and access to, um, to the Capacity Vault system. Are there any other questions? And um, Rachel, did did I deal with your question at the um, during the um, seminar about sound mind properly? Was that all? Um... I thought I'd say uh, I, I might as well answer you properly. <laughs> um, Thank you. Yeah, kind of. Actually, I'd um, sorry, just pulling off my chair now. It's really good. <laughs> um, I actually, it was the it was the bit at the end of that about being um, being delusion, delu delusional or confused. Which, and I don't, I'm not sure I actually quite understand what the difference between being of sound mind and being insane or delusional is right, right. In, um, in legal terms. But maybe it's a bit too much for nuance. So I can I can hopefully deal with that in the last sort of minute or so that we've got. Um, being of sound mind, um, that, that, that's knowing what you're doing when you make the will. Um, do you, are you aware of the fact that you, what, the thing that you're signing um, is a will, do you know what it does? If you do, great. Um, you are of sound mind, you understand what putting pen to paper, uh, what the legal effect of that is. Any insane delusion or disorder of the mind is a different um, test. And that can mean that you do know um, what's what's going on. Um, I think that the case of, um, the case I've got that, that went into this was a um, someone who was delusional. I think now they'd probably be, um, uh, have a diagnosis, but I have no idea what it was back in the um, 19th century. They thought people were following him. They thought that somebody, uh, an imagined um, threat was out to get him and he was acting on that imagined threat. Now he knew that he um, signing a will was gonna um, uh, depose of his estate. He knew what he owned. He was a wealthy 
um, chap, despite um, despite all the other challenges of life threw at him. He's he a wealthy fella. And he knew what his family was, but he was acting um, under, um, you know, what was what was called a, a delusion, um, acting under what was uh, called a disorder of the mind. Um, and he made a will, which was later challenged. Uh, so that that's the difference. So he knew exactly what he was doing, but he was acting. Um, uh, he was acting um, due to his delusions. Does that help at all? If you've got anything which is a live case, obviously I cannot comment on that um, any deeper, but if, if there's any guidance or signposting I can give, um, do please get in touch. Uh, I want the best outcomes uh, for you. Um, so possibly better we take this offline and I'll give information that, that I'm able and signposting that I'm able. Is that... Um, yeah, no, thank, thank you. And actually, that case is the case I mentioned is now resolved, but um, it was quite interesting um, following it because uh, the, the person who was contesting it was trying to claim that because um, his relative had suffered from depression, she couldn't have known what she was what she was writing in her will. But luckily, the solicitor had a lot of had some file, had a case file with notes in it, which proved that she had had conversations with him when he made the will. And she was very clear about what she wanted to, where she wanted to leave her um, legacy, which was all to us. That's why it became contested. So, yeah, it's interesting. I'm also actually just a, sorry, sorry, everybody else if this is, um, but I'm really interested in the ex gratia payment change because mm -hmm. we have just had a very kind of laborious process of trying to get a very small um, amount of a large estate agreed as an ex gratia payment, which was really clear. This is what the lady who died wanted to happen. She had died before she was able to sign her new will, which left a very small gift to an additional relative. And we had to go through a torturous process with the Charity Commission to get that agreed. So I'm really pleased to see that change coming through. Good. Yeah, I think that's precisely the sort of reason I thought would be um, this would be of use to um, to this group here. So um, I'm going to circulate um, those uh, links to all of that information, so you can go straight to the um, straight to the source on it um, on on each of those three points. Um, so Rachel, thank you, thank you everybody, thank you so much for giving your time to um, to come along today. Um, if you have any other questions off the back of this. Uh, reply to the email that you're going to get, reach out and speak with us. Um, otherwise, uh, wish you all the very best and, and, and thank you again. Yeah, thanks for joining everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.